Yes, I want to say that. I don't know that. how else to introduce you. Good. Can I just start? So sure. basically, I have divided this into two chunks. I think they will take roughly 20 minutes each. And in between, we can have discussion and then again, discussion afterwards. So I start you off with the question of how the good folks of the Enlightenment would think about our time. So imagine them transplanted into our day and looking around and trying to get to understand our world, how would they react to that? So I think they would, of course, be impressed with all the gadgets that we have. Electricity, for example, wasn't available in the Enlightenment period, and certainly not iPhones and computers and uh, airplanes and so forth. These are all uh, pretty astonishing things, and they would be uh, impressed by that, but not terribly surprised, I think. They would have predicted that things like that will will be invented and will be widely available. They wouldn't have imagined them precisely, but they would have imagined them vaguely and uh, in general. But looking at our social life, the way we organize our societies, I think that the Enlightenment thinkers would have been deeply disappointed. They lived in a period of great optimism where they thought that we would make, humanity would make continuous progress, and they would be disappointed by how little progress we have made. In particular, they would be disappointed by the continued existence of war. So Kant, in the Metaphysics of Morals, scolds human beings and says, you know, they settle their differences like savages do. They beat each other up until one party wins. It's a barbaric way to settle differences by force and threat of force, rather than through argument as if by a lawsuit. So that would certainly be a major disappointment that wars are still around and we still threaten one another with violence. And in a way, war has become worse. War now poses an existential threat to humanity and many other life forms on the planet, given the kinds of weapons that we have and given how widespread access to these weapons has become. We have also not eradicated severe poverty. According to the latest booklet of the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, fully 42% of humanity are unable to afford a healthy diet, which they value at the purchasing power equivalent of $3.54 per person per day. The average income in the world today is $55 per person per day. That's the average. But it's so incredibly unevenly distributed that you have billionaires at one end who can, if they want to, spend thousands, if not millions of dollars every day. And then you have half of humankind being very poor, unable even to afford a healthy diet. It's not that they don't eat a healthy diet. Many of us don't. But they can't even afford it. They couldn't if they wanted to get enough nutritious food. Another problem is that we haven't aligned human activities with the need to preserve a hospitable planet. This is the whole problem of air pollution, climate change, microplastics, and so forth, that will plague your generation even more than it did ours. Even today, more than 8 million human beings die every year from air pollution. And of course, climate change holds in store even much worse calamities. We have also not achieved global governance institutions that fairly take account of the needs of all. International politics is dominated by a very small minority, essentially those people who can influence powerful governments and everybody else who lives in the weaker countries or is weak within their own country, has no chance at all uh, to influence the way this planet is organized and run. 
So what the Enlightenment thinkers would conclude looking around in today's world is that relative to our vastly greater technological, economic, and administrative capabilities, we are doing extremely poorly. We are much more able to create a reasonable world, a world in accordance with reason, but we haven't really managed to do this. In fact, there is a real danger that without substantial moral progress in this 21st century, the past gains in quality of human life, at least for some parts of humankind, that these gains will be reversed. Now, why is this happening? Why have we not made the kind of progress that the Enlightenment thinkers would have thought we would achieve if we had these capabilities that in fact we have? Why have we fallen short of our potential to such a dramatic extent? I think it is because of how we organize humanity. And here's a passage from Kant from Perpetual Peace that I want to read to you where he says, for states in their relation to one another, there cannot be any reasonable way out of their lawless condition, which entails only war, except that they, like individual human beings, should give up their savage, lawless freedom, adjust themselves to public coercive laws, and thus establish a continuously growing international state which will ultimately include all the nations of the world. But under the idea of the law of nations, they absolutely do not wish to do this, and so reject in practice what is correct in theory. If all is not to be lost, there can be then in place of the positive idea of a world republic, only be the negative surrogate of an alliance which averts war, endures, spreads, and checks the force of that hostile inclination away from law, though such an alliance is in constant peril of its breaking loose again. So Kant is here distinguishing, I think, three worlds. One world in which we just have rival actors settling their differences with violence. One world, which he calls a world republic or a world state, which is a morally based order where differences are settled by the example of legal proceedings. You settle differences by argument. And then there's an in-between world, which he thinks is maybe the one that we can actually reach and that was to some extent already present in the time of his writing, a kind of federation of states, an alliance of states, a collaboration of states under rules. I call this, following my thesis advisor John Rawls, the modus vivendi world, and I want to analyze it a little bit because that's the world that we are living in, and I want to show its advantages and pitfalls and disadvantages and dangers. So a modus vivendi world is a world that is based on prudence. There are shared rules, and these rules make the behavior of the various national actors predictable to some extent. And these rules survive and persist and continue to be complied with so long as all parties are known to have sufficient prudential reasons for compliance. So such a world is based on prudence. Everybody works within the rules if and insofar as they have sufficient prudential reasons to do so. Now, the prudential reasons of a party depend on its power which is its threat potential and vulnerabilities, what threats can it issue and what threats is it liable to from the part of others. And it depends on its interests, what its goals are, what it is trying to achieve. Now, a modus vivendi can last through changes 
in the power and interests of participants. And this is possible through renegotiations. The rules can, when power and interest distribution changes, the rules can be renegotiated to make sure that they continue to be in each party's rational interest. What happens here is that strengthening parties, parties that become stronger, will press for more favorable terms, and parties that become weaker acquiesce in order to induce continued compliance by the stronger. So they will accept less favorable terms because they want the stronger parties to continue to be prudentially motivated to play by the rules. So we have a flexible equilibrium, a power equilibrium under rules that get continuously adapted to changes in the distribution of power and interests of the parties. And this flexible equilibrium is liable to spirals. By spirals, I mean the following. Suppose a party becomes stronger. It has more power for whatever reason. So there's new allies or new resources or whatever, new technologies. Now, this party will want to renegotiate the rules. It will say, now that I'm stronger, I want the terms of our collaboration to be more favorable to myself. And as I said before, the weaker parties have reason to concede because they want the modus vivendi to continue to be stable, to continue to exist. Now, what will the stronger party, what will it want? It will want changes in the rules that give it further advantages, that strengthen it even more. In the old days, countries would ask for tribute, for example. There won't be war, but you have to pay us some money every year. Nowadays, they might ask for trade concessions or something else. By asking for that and by getting it, the strengthening party will be strengthened even further because it will now have additional resources, additional advantages that may increase its power. And so there could be an upward spiral where the strengthening party gets more power, better rules, more power again, once more better rules, and so on. And of course, something similar can happen to parties that become weaker. They become weaker, then they are forced to concede a weakening of the terms of participation. They become weaker again, and they slowly spiral downward into potentially oblivion, into the dustbin of history if things become very bad. This almost happened to Poland in 1939 and 1940 when it almost completely disappeared from the map. So these spirals are dangerous in the sense that they don't protect you even against the very worst outcomes. So a modus vivendi and a veneer of civility is an all-out struggle for power that ultimately is unlimited. It doesn't really move us very far away from a world of rivalrous states, you know, the kind of first world that I distinguished. It is much more civil, it is rule-governed, but ultimately the worst possible outcomes are just as bad as they are in a world of unlimited rivalry. So understanding this, understanding this kind of danger of a downward spiral, each party must prioritize its own survival and power under the fancy name of national security over all else. You really have to play hardball in a modus vivendi in order to assure your long-term survival. So a modus vivendi cannot really be one in which trust arises, in which mutually beneficial, reliable agreements are made. It's very difficult, at least, to solve collective action problems in such a state because each party must 
prioritize its national security, its power position vis-a-vis -vis the others. And parties know this of each other. We know that the other parties we are interacting with must prioritize their own power, acquisition and preservation of power above all else. Now, this is also very painful in terms of moral values. So, of course, we have moral values. We are very committed to our moral values. But we cannot really, in the international arena, live up to our moral values, like human rights, truth, democracy, and so on, because we have to prioritize the preservation and acquisition of power. We have to prioritize securing our long-term influence and the long-term survival of our values and way of life. So when we are competing with the Russians or the Chinese or whatever other grand power, or they with us, of course, they have to focus on power and must sideline values. Now, this is the way in which people in the defense departments of this world and the state departments, the way they analyze the situation, and so long as they analyze the situation in this way, this will be our situation. If this is how the Chinese politicians think, then we must think that way in terms of power and interests in order to prevail, in order to defend our values, in order to make sure that we and our people and our values survive. And of course, the same is true of them. If our politicians think this way, then they must think this way. So this is the basics of a modus vivendi framework, but I want to enrich this uh, analysis with one more point about the nature of political power. Now, it's become conventional to think of political power as having three sources. There's military power, economic power, and a kind of grab bag left over category of soft power, which includes such things as culture, you know, having popular TV programs is soft power, uh, having moral standing in the world is soft power, controlling the media is soft power. So it's a grab bag of various different things that can also enhance the influence that a state can exert in the world. Now, these three sources of power don't have a fixed exchange rate, but rather the exchange rate among these three currencies, if you like, depends on the context. If you're in the middle of the Second World War, then military power is by far the most important. Stalin expressed that by saying, Ah, the Pope, how many divisions does he have? Basically saying, you know, everything other than military power in 1944 is, is sort of almost meaningless, even though economic power, of course, has a big influence of one's military power in the long run. Now, the fact of this context dependence of the exchange rates means that different parties have different interests in regard to context. If you derive your political power mainly from your military power, then of course you want the world to be one in which military power is worth a lot. If conversely you derive your political power mainly from soft power, like Norway, for example, then you will want the world to be peaceful and one in which military power doesn't have a lot of influence. So there is then a meta competition among states over what kind of environment the world shall be in, an environment in which which kind of power will be particularly prized and important. The same is also true within 
parties in regard to context. So in the US, for example, we have competition for power between the legislative branch, the executive branch, and ju the judicial branch. And how much power each of these three branches of government has will also be influenced by the global context. So in a situation of military confrontation, hostility, tension, even war, in such a context, the executive will have a lot of power relative to the other two branches of government, whereas in a more peaceful global context, the other two branches will have more power relative to the executive. And that means that depending on the global geopolitical context, uh, the power distribution will be quite different. And it also means that different political actors will have opposing interests in how they want the global geopolitical situation to be. Some will want peace. Japan, for example, Germany will want peace. Others will be ex officio, kind of institutionally, interested in confrontation, tension, not necessarily war, but certainly a situation where war isn't very far away. And so given the analysis I gave, uh, the U.S. president, whoever may occupy that office, is one of those who is always going to be interested in a bit of tension, hostility, adversarial relations among states, because that will increase his power or her power within the United States, and it will also increase the power of the United States in the international arena. This is so because US military power is enormous. The US controls at least half of all military power in the world, whereas it controls only about one sixth of economic power and somewhere in between, I would think, a percentage of soft power. So there is this asymmetry here that a context of tension, hostility, and crisis, which increases the relative weight of military power, is much easier to create and maintain than to end or to avoid. It is always easy to create a bit of a fight, a bit of tension, a bit of hostility, than it is to maintain the world in a peaceful state. And therefore, among prudent power seekers, violence is an ever-present threat and option. It is really impossible within a modus vivendi framework to achieve genuine, stable, perpetual peace. And again, let me repeat why that is so. There will always be actors who are stronger militarily than in the other two categories of power. This is a simple mathematical fact that if you think of each dimension as having 100%, let's say, there will be some whose percentage, whose share of military power will be greater than their share of economic and soft power. And those parties and especially the executive powers within those parties, then have a vested interest, if they want to maximize their power, in keeping the world in a state of tension and hostility, because that is a state in which their military prowess counts the most, counts more and gives them more political power. So if we want a world of perpetual peace, a world in which differences are settled in a way of legal proceedings the way Kant envisaged, then we really have to overcome the modus vivendi among states, and we have to move to a kind of morally based world order. 
And that is particularly urgent given the insecurities, the unsafety of a modus vivendi state in a world in which there's ever wider access to weapons of mass destruction and to artificial intelligence, and in which we also face an ecological emergency and pandemic threats that are difficult to resolve in a modus vivendi context, because everyone yeah. will say, yeah, yeah, there's climate change, I know, but I have to prioritize my long-term survival, my power preservation and acquisition over everything else, over the common tasks of humankind. So I will stop here. That's the first part. And this is going to be the second, if you have the patient to the patients to engage with it. But let's stop here and think about the first part first. So I'll stop the share so that we can see each other. And I look forward to your comments, questions, objections, expressions of outrage, whatever you may want to throw at me. Could I start? Of course. I wanted to ask, um, so you've, you, I think you've underplayed a little bit economic power. You did notice that it was supporting military power in some ways, but it also has, like it expands into other areas of, of life and, um, and maybe presents some kind of a way out of the conundrum. But maybe not. I don't know. Maybe not. Yeah. The thing is, uh, again, looking at it through the eyes of the Enlightenment, uh, Kant, for example, hated the idea that people who are richer get any kind of power or recognition out of that. So he lived in a time of feudalism. Uh, he spent his early years actually as a private tutor on uh, outside Königsberg. He was in various places where he was a servant, you know, with rich people, and he was giving private lessons to spoiled brat children who were above him in rank, uh, who basically he couldn't discipline in any way, really, and uh, on whose goodwill he depended. You know, and the kid went to the daddy and said, you know, I want this guy out of here and I want someone else. Uh, then he would be dismissed and would lose his income. So uh, he as you probably know, he opposed uh, equal voting rights uh, for people, even for servants and serfs. But he did so because he was afraid that rich landowners could just line up their servants and have them vote in whatever way they told them to vote. That was his reason to do that. So uh, Kant would have been uh, almost as suspicious of uh, political decisions being influenced by economic power as he was of political decisions being influenced by military power. He really wanted soft power and a certain kind of soft power, namely the soft power of the better argument, the forceless force of the better argument, as my friend Habermas likes to call it. That is what he wanted to determine political outcomes. I think there's a question in the chat. Oh, let's look at that. David says, didn't this modus vivendi, didn't this also exist before human civilization? Uh, yes. Uh, I remember when Jerry and I were living together a long, long time ago. We were roommates or apartment mates, I should say. Uh, I once asked you about a translation uh, Syntestai Alelois in Greek. You remember that? I long, long time remember. ago. <laughs> and in any case, the, uh, we had a very good discussion following that. And uh, the, the thing there is that, yes, of course, a modus, vi, a modus vivendi kind of arrangements existed uh, a long, long time ago, but they existed in a partial way. They were sort of a modus vivendi between two parties or maybe three parties. 
but there were many of them all over the place. And uh, that is very different from the system that we have now, where we have one pretty much global modus vivendi system. So we have, for example, trade rules that govern the whole globe. This is relatively new. It, it, uh, the, the, that it finally became fully global is mainly in the 1990s, where the Soviet Union had collapsed and the U.S., took the lead in creating this global system. And many things that used to be subject to smaller agreements, regional or even just national, were shifted upward to the global level. The WTO is maybe the paradigm example of that. You know, very rich and complex trade rules that govern all WTO member states, which is basically everybody. You know, the, with two or three very minor exceptions, every state is a member of the WTO, and they have to be more or less a member of the WTO if they want to not fall way behind uh, economically. So we have a, we have always had modus vivendi systems. For example, uh, you know, a, a couple, a man and his wife, have a modus vivendi in various sorts where power can shift and all the things I said can, can happen. But uh, this, the large-scale worldwide modus vivendi system is new. In Kant's day or in the Enlightenment period, there was a kind of modus vivendi system in Europe, a, a system where there were certain rules of diplomacy, uh, rules of warfare, and so on, but it was a much, much thinner system than it is now, and it was not global. Any other thoughts? I'm saving you here. Hmm? You wanna go ahead and speak? <laughs> Sorry, you're talking to me or someone else? Uh, there's iPad uh, oh. Steve Zainab Basin. iPad oh. Basin. <laughs> I told Jerry that Basin is the German word for broom. Yeah. So yeah. you want to go ahead? I think they just don't have the mic muted and it's background noises. I think that's what's yeah. happening. I see. We okay. will just mute that, mute that iPad, which we did. Okay. Any other thoughts? Was it clear? Was it interesting? Yeah, this, this is all new to me, so I'm just kind of soaking it in. Soaking it in. Good. <laughs> I'm happy to go on, but uh, I was hoping that can I ask one more question? Before? Yeah, of course, of course. I It sounded to me like Kant was saying that, saying that he did want a system that would be um, something that all of the different nations adhered to and that that would solve the problem. Now, obviously, it doesn't solve the problem of the military force ruling that system, but... Um, or or the power structure of that system but is this how how is what we have right now different from what Kant hoped could happen in a system like that other so, than just that we would solve everything <clears throat> by law so Kant if you remember the passage that I read uh, where Kant distinguishes two different solutions basically one solution is the world republic we basically take the model of a republic, which we are familiar with from within nation states, and we globalize it. We create a world state with common institutions. Uh, the other model that he presents is this idea of a federation. And he says that's the only realistic model. Uh, he was, I think, afraid of being dismissed as a utopian which has happened, had happened to Abbé de Saint-Pierre, for example, 
uh, in uh, so he he kind of holds this world republic idea uh, on the side and focuses on developing the idea of this federation this modus vivendi kind of system but uh, he was very well aware of the dangers and pitfalls of a modus vivendi and i think he highlighted it in order to a be realistic not to be dismissed and b also because he thought that it was in any case on the way towards a world republic if we ever want to achieve a world republic we have to pass through a federation of states a kind of modus vivendi system in that system maybe there will be enough stability trust will build up a certain averted aversion popular aversion to war will develop and people will just become more reasonable and so gradually people will say war is just ridiculous you know it shouldn't exist anymore and they will make it harder and harder for governments to go to war and we can that way maybe achieve a transition to a world republic now one big mistake in kant's thinking was that he thought that sovereignty must be located at one place so he thought for example that there cannot be a real division of power within the state the legislature the law giving branch of government must be the sovereign and it must be able to dismiss the others he also thought that there couldn't be a genuine division of power between different levels so there cannot be any genuine federalism there cannot be a federal world republic now if you correct that mistake which we can with the hindsight of 200 years of experience looking at the us germany switzerland and so on if we correct that mistake we can say look there is the possibility of a world republic that has institutions global governing institutions but not all powerful ones there can be such a thing as divided sovereignty between the global level and the national level and i think that is the kind of morally based world republic model that kant would have endorsed if he had been able to think it through one more time with 200 years 220 years of hindsight <laughs> did um david is asking in the questions uh it's sort of uh i think with a with a a bit of slyness did kant want ascendancy of soft power because that was his comparative advantage but <laughs> what you're saying is <laughs> so <laughs> that's why the philosophers this is very good i like that this is a very good it's a very good analogy that's that's his advantage yeah, yeah. Uh, of course my answer is predictably is no uh, you know about uh, you know frederick the great he has this famous quote that the first thing any machiavellian should do is to write a treatise against machiavelli <laughs> the uh, uh, this is a, a, a clever a clever point and uh yeah of course the official answer to this is not at all you know it's the other way round it is because we philosophers have realized that the only way to create a reasonable world in which values can really flourish is a world in which soft, soft power the better argument reigns supreme that's why we have trained ourselves in the skills of assessing arguments and so it uh, you know we we could have been warriors but we deliberately chose not to be warriors we deliberately chose to live in the world of good arguments but you should be suspicious of this reply of course All right, I will monitor the chat and see whether any more Ah, great. You have Abbé de Saint-Pierre. I'm just looking up Frederick 
the great dates. Now, didn't Kant, Kant kind of admired Frederick the Great a lot, didn't he? Yes, he did. He did, uh, and he was uh, he admired the successors much less. Uh, you remember that one of his successors uh, sent a rider to Königsberg, which at that time took about two weeks, to tell Kant that he was never to write upon religion again. <laughs> so this was the education minister, Wurmer, who intensely disliked Kant's religion within the limits of reason alone. What do you mean within the limits of reason? Religion is all is at the top. No limits. <laughs> anyway, so that writer was sent. Kant promised not to write on religion. And then he wrote into his diary or his reflexionen. When the king finally died, he said, well, if the king is dead, my promise, of course, is also dead. <laughs> he died shortly afterwards, but survived that particular administration. Good. Any other thoughts, comments, or should I go to the second part? Okay, I see two thumbs up. So I will share the screen. Yeah. So in the second half, I want to talk a little bit about how a moral world order is possible. How uh, how can we get out of this mess of a modus vivendi, which is you know probably going to spell the end of humankind within a century or two, if we stick to it, if we can't get out of it. So we have a model, a model in today's nation states, and again here I follow Kant who was saying, you know, we need a world republic. And he was basically saying, we need to bring the model that we have, the best, most advanced states, we need to bring that model to the world at large. We have to have proper democratic institutions uh, to run the whole world. So the way it works, we have shared values that are deeply entrenched in a society. Their violation is widely condemned even by those who stand to benefit therefrom. And so these entrenched values provide constraints on the exercise of power. If you try to renegotiate those values, or even worse, if you breach these values, you've got the whole society against you. For example, if anybody says in the United States, you know, the next election will not happen, I will just stay in power, uh, there will be an outcry and uh, you wouldn't get away with it, even if uh, the other party stands to win the elections. Now, uh, one way in which that has application in our societies, in the most advanced societies in the world, is in terms of corruption or what you might call nepotism. Nepotism is from the Latin word for nephew and refers to the use of public office for obtaining private benefits for oneself or one's family and friends. And here we interpret the institution and its values in such a way that they provide exclusionary moral reasons that are even stronger than a lexical priority. Let me explain what I mean by that. We have an institution in which you may play a certain role. You may be a teacher at a university or the principal of a high school or uh, have an office, uh, a governmental office in some way. And the way we regard these offices in our advanced societies is that we say that if you act within your role in as an office holder in that institution, you must not give the slightest weight to your other affiliations. For example, to the fact that you are also a mother or a friend of somebody, and so on. You must not do any kind of favors. You must 
execute your office strictly impartially, whereas once you leave that office at five in the evening, of course you can pay special attention to your hubby or to your kids or to your friends and so on and so forth. So it's this demand of absolute impartiality that is that I find on reflection quite surprising that this has evolved in human history. And it is stronger than a lexical priority in that you cannot even use the fact that somebody is your friend or that somebody is your husband. You cannot even use that as a tiebreaker. If there is a decision which you have to make as office holder between your child and a stranger, you're supposed to recuse yourself. You're supposed to, or flip a coin or something. You are not supposed to, even when the two are otherwise equally matched, give preference to the person who is your child or your friend. So this exclusionary impartial commitment is one that we are expected to practice in our public roles but of course doesn't infect our private roles. Once you get home from the office, you can lavish all the attention you like on your friends and family and uh, completely ignore the strangers. Interestingly, this exclusionary impartial commitment is also demanded from us as citizens. So when we as citizens act with that role of citizen, in the public discourse and weigh in on matters of justice and the common good, we are expected to act impartially, to speak impartially, not to represent our own personal interests, but really to speak up for what we conscientiously believe is in the public interest or demanded by justice. And we have this normative expectation of office holders. We say that we demand of our public officials and of our fellow citizens when they speak in a public capacity, we demand that they practice this exclusionary impartiality. And we demand that even if they are in our camp, even if they have interests that are similar to our own, we condemn them if they, so to speak, abuse their public role, their office, their citizenship, uh, in order to promote the, their own interests or the interests of their friends in a way that is inappropriate given the role from which they speak. So I give you some examples. Uh, think of a mother who is principal of a school. Her child is in that same school. And of course, her child is just as interested in GPA as any other child is. And she as a mother is very interested in the GPA of her child. So uh, she has the strongest possible bond in uh, to her child mother-child bonds are extremely powerful, as we all know. And yet, society is expecting from this mother that she not lift a finger in order to improve the GPA of her child. For example, it would be very inappropriate for the principal to approach one of the teachers and say, you know, Mr. Biology teacher, couldn't you just make this a little this grade a little better for my child. You know, my child's GPA is, is suffering. This is something that we deeply condemn as corruption and nepotism, even though we recognize that the mother-child relation is among the deepest bonds that human beings are capable of. And, uh, you know, nonetheless, we condemn it. Another example where this happens is in athletics and team sports. Athletes are incredibly committed to their sport. They're incredibly committed to winning. And yet a true athlete would never dream of 
trying to win by, for example, slipping some uh, medication into the dinner of the opponents so that they have to go to the bathroom a lot or something of that sort. So you desperately want to win, but you even more desperately want to win in a fair competition with others. You want to win on a level playing field. And again, we make that distinction between the level playing field on the one hand and winning on the other. We place the commitment to the level playing field above the commitment to winning uh, in much the same way as we place impartiality of uh, role occupants above any interests that they might have as individuals in, in a private capacity. So another example is you have a government office. For example, you're the secretary of health and human services in the US. And of course, you love your home state of Wisconsin. You want all the best for Wisconsin. You care more about Wisconsin than you care about New Jersey and about Connecticut. So, okay. But as the occupant of the role of secretary of HHS, we absolutely demand of you that you leave your love for Wisconsin at home when you execute the office, when you exercise your powers of office. And this is even true of internet bloggers. If an internet blogger writes a blog about admission policies of engineering colleges, what is the right way for the Supreme Court to decide what kind of preferences are admissible in admission decisions for engineering colleges? And if you post a blog on that as a citizen, we expect you not to be influenced by the yourself or the interests of your own children or something like that. We expect you to speak impartially <laughs> as, you know, from the standpoint of what is right and good rather than be influenced by your interests or your own situation. So this distinction that citizens are, as it were, wearing different hats, we are wearing different hats where sometimes we are in our private capacity, where of course we can favor our friends and family. And sometimes we are in a public or uh, capacity of citizen or public official, where we absolutely must not allow our personal private interests to have any influence at all on our decision making. This sort of two hats uh, picture is a picture that we have internalized in advanced societies. And it's that kind of picture, that kind of division that I think we need as a first step on the global level as well. So let me say that one thing that favored the emergence, what I think is the very unlikely and really remarkable emergence of this kind of impartiality requirement is the fact that it is collectively beneficial. So states are competing with each other and states that manage to prescribe nepotism and corruption have an advantage over states that don't. And I think this advantage has played a major role in gradually the emergence of this impartiality value in the most advanced societies. Societies were at least sort of implicitly aware of the fact that rooting out nepotism and partiality and corruption gives them an advantage over other societies. And that dimly realized realization of the advantage played a role in the historical evolution of this kind of impartiality requirement. Or so I believe. 
So when you interfere with an efficient merit-based division of labor, then you are slowing down your own society, make it less competitive against other societies and less able to solve its own problems. As a result, it is maybe not quite as surprising anymore that this impartiality requirement has evolved in the most successful societies that we know today. It may be one of the greatest civilizational advances in human history that you overcome these very strong bonds among people and demand of office holders to set these bonds aside and to act impartially and for the common good. Now, as I said, I think that this sort of impartiality requirement would be a very important step to achieve also at the global level. So that would mean that those involved in creating or revising international laws and treaties or in shaping or administering intergovernmental agencies and organizations, they should be not allowed to robustly advance the interests of their home country. Today, the opposite, of course, is the case. All the people who are delegated by their countries to participate in international negotiations are fully expected to do so in behalf of their country, defending the interests of their country and making all sorts of maybe moral arguments, but really be guided by what is best for their country, what is best for increasing the power, influence, and position of their home state. So today, uh, practice in the international arena is highly tolerant of such national partiality, even when it comes to formulating, interpreting, applying, and enforcing international agreements, and in regard to day-to-day -day operations of intergovernmental agencies and organizations. So when you see the various nationalities represented on an international court or in an international agency, you will very often find that their disagreements about what the group should do, their disagreements fall out along the fault lines of nationality. Basically, the various officials are representing the interests of their countries and are trying to influence international organizations to act in a way that's favorable for their own country. So I think that the dangers that we went through in the first half of the ongoing international modus vivendi can be overcome if we deeply internalize the kind of impartiality requirement that I said was widely uh, instantiated in the most advanced societies in the world today. And realizing that impartiality requirement would require deep internalization of it so that the populations of countries, especially the powerful countries, would normatively expect their leaders in international negotiations to stand up for what is right and for the common good, rather than sometimes at the expense of what is good for their own home country. So this would be a very dramatic departure Right? We today we expect the Secretary of Health and Human Services from Wisconsin in the execution of her office to forget the fact that she's from Wisconsin. But we certainly don't expect the President of the United States in international negotiations about how to arrange the world economy, say, to forget the fact that he or she is the president of the United States. On the contrary, we expect our president 
to roll up her sleeves and to fight for our interests against the interests of China and Africa and Latin America and so on, everybody else. So it's a pretty dramatic change that I'm asking for, but it is a change that is completely continuous and analogous to what we already deeply believe in at the national level. And if we had that sort of system, if the president of the United States were assured that his or her re-election depends on her living up to that standard, being impartial in international negotiations, then, of course, other countries could have trust in us. They could say, if that's what they put forward, they put forward in good faith, because if they didn't, if they didn't act in good faith, then they, the government of the United States, would be condemned by its own people. The U.S. people want the president, their president, or their negotiators to act impartially in international negotiations. So here's a tiny starting point that is already realized today, a tiny one. It's UN Charter, Article 100, which is about the Secretary General. So here it says, in the performance of their duties, the Secretary General and the staff shall not seek or receive instructions from any government or from any other authority external to the organization. They shall refrain from any action which might reflect on their position as international officials responsible only to the organization. And it goes on. Each member of the United Nations undertakes to respect the exclusively international character of the responsibilities of the Secretary General and of the staff and not to seek to influence them in the discharge of their responsibilities. Nice language, but as you, if you follow the news, you probably saw that we, the United States, were just caught in uh, eavesdropping on the Secretary General of the United Nations. We had, you know, uh, anyway, eavesdropping equipment and uh, not so nice, but there you go. We are far, far away from realizing what I think uh, I'm asking for. Now, is what I'm asking for feasible? Could this happen? Of course it could happen. If human beings can and do limit the scope of their partiality toward their spouses, towards their parents and children, then surely they can also be led to limit it toward their home country and compatriots. Our attachment to our fellow nationals and our country is deep, of course, but it's not as deep as our commitment to our loved ones, our children, our parents. So if we can be impartial as office holders and set aside our love to our spouses, parents, and children, then surely we can be impartial in international contexts, setting aside our love to our country and our compatriots, especially if this is something that they themselves accept, right? So this impartiality requirement is one that our spouses and children and parents accept. Even your daughter can understand that you as principal of the school cannot favor her. That doesn't mean that mom doesn't love me. It means that mom is the principal of the school, and as the principal, she has to be impartial, no matter how much she loves me. And of course, outside the school, she can do lots of things for me, and any child can understand that. Any child of moderate age can understand that, that the fact that my mother doesn't bump up my GPA doesn't mean she doesn't love me. She just 
is the principle. She can't do it. It's against an even more fundamental principle of fairness and impartiality. And similarly, of course, citizens can understand that. Our president is supposed to act for us. He is supposed to represent us. And in international contexts, he has to represent us, not only our interests, but also our responsibilities, our duties, our commitments. And because we are committed to a fair and level playing field internationally, we expect our president to fight for a fair and level playing field, even when doing so is not in the best interest of the United States, is not maximizing the power of the United States. So what the teenager can understand about her mother, citizens can understand about their government. We have to be in certain contexts impartial between the interests of the country that we represent and other countries. So again, it's a, it's a big somewhat utopian step, but I think without that step, we will not get to a world in which moral values prevail, in which arguments carry the day rather than military and economic power. Now, one thing that you will have noticed makes it hard to hope for this kind of progress, and that is that the same evolutionary pressures that led gradually to the impartiality requirement becoming commonplace in the most advanced states, these evolutionary pressures that come from competition among states will not help us at the global level, at least not unless Martians appear. And miraculously, <laughs> we can actually become more successful in competing with the Martians by institutionalizing a culture of impartiality at the international level. So I think the feasibility of this is demonstrated by the most advanced nation states where violence and threats of violence are no longer significant sources of political influence. If you are a kickbox fighter and have five bodyguards, it doesn't help you in a US courtroom. If you're rich, it doesn't help, but it helps you in a US courtroom, I suppose, but not in the most advanced countries' courtrooms. Uh, we have, you know, freedom to organize doesn't depend on how strong or numerous or rich a particular community is. And we have governments and state agencies led and staffed by officials that internalize the impartiality commitment. Now, the same sort of thing could happen at the international level. Uh, we could envisage a post-modus vivendi world in which states shape their foreign policies and international design goals to manifestly accord with this vision, to manifestly accord with impartiality, a level playing field, a fair environment of rules in which all states can thrive. So that would be a world in which violence and threat of threats of violence are no longer significant sources of influence, in which economic inequality is moderate and no source of political domination, in which countries securely enjoy the freedom to organize themselves according to their own values, consistent with and protected by globally shared values and their embodiment in the global order, and in which new and old global institutions such as the UN, the WTO, and so on, are led and staffed by officials who are loyal to humanity and its shared values and principles rather than to their own home state. This is, by the way, beginning to emerge in the EU, the European Union. Initially, it was still the case that 
EU officials were pushing the line that was most beneficial to their home state. But gradually, the kind of impartiality mindset is taking hold in the European Union, uh, very nicely exemplified by van der Leyen's inaugural speech when she became commission president recently. She said that I will be the commission president of all of Europe. I will forget, so to speak, that I'm German and I will be European first and only. So we are moving in some small ways in that direction, but of course we need it globally and the European Union is very much uh, a club of states that are defending their common interests against others, very much still in the old power fold of defending, you know, trying to make Europe more powerful against the US, against China, and against Russia. Now, what else can we do to build a world of genuine international peace in which violence has become marginalized and economic power has faded as a source of political power and influence? We can undertake uh, reforms, gradual reforms of the international institutional architecture changing pieces that now clearly reflect the balance of power among states by substitutes that clearly reflect a moral uh, set of values. So, for example, the international trading regime very clearly reflects the economic power of the various states, and we could reform it in a way that it reflects our common moral imperative to keep poverty at bay, to make sure that all human beings have enough to eat and have the basic essentials of a worthwhile human life. It's just grotesque that with an average income of $55 per person per day, 42% of humanity can't even afford the $3.50 they need to buy an adequate diet. So there are many examples of bits and pieces of the global institutional architecture that we could reform, reform in a moral way. And if we do that together, we would gradually build up trust in the good faith of one another and gradually become convinced that a genuinely moral world order is possible. We have to, at the beginning, engage in these substitutions in a way that affects the power balance as little as possible, because as soon as a modification affects the power balance among it, especially the more powerful states, of course, these states become suspicious and they say, oh, this is just being done under the name of morality, of course, but done in order to shift the power power balance against me. So it's very important to start with projects where the main beneficiaries are uh, populations that have very little power, for example, populations in Africa, and where the balance of power among the main players, the so-called great powers, is not really affected. Good. This is the end of part two. And again, I look forward to your thoughts and comments. Wow, that was a lot. <laughs> Yeah, it was a lot, but it's a huge task and I cannot help but hope that your generation will be more successful than ours has been. So you have to understand this and you have to fight for it or else there won't be many generations after yours. 
I have a question about the education that would need to be in place across the world for people to understand. I mean, it's one thing to understand what your job is as the school principal and how to carry that out and how not to be partial. But um, there's kind of a mix, like I was thinking education and, and self-love rhetoric um, among the nations makes it very difficult for people to both to understand the task um, and also to set aside their preference for their own country because they might think that their own country is a good model for the rest of the world. And they would want to perpetuate whatever is happening in their own country and also feel that it's virtuous to push their own country forward. Yeah, so uh, with regard to saying that our country has good values, uh, of course, that is perfectly fine. There's absolutely nothing wrong with saying that we should have this uh, a similar sort of democratic setup at the global level as we have in the United States of America. That would be uh, fantastic. And uh, I think the US would have a lot of support with that proposal. But uh, it's not very often heard from American politicians that they say, oh, let's have a UN parliament where we, which is modeled on the Congress and maybe a Senate where, you know, Senate we already have, the UN General Assembly, so to speak, could be a kind of Senate and, you know, model these institutions. The US is, is hostile to democracy in the international arena for the obvious reason that it has far more military and economic power then it's 4% of the world population would give it democratic political power in a world parliament. So that's totally fine, right? You make arguments and these arguments will be examined by everybody else on their merit. That is exactly as it should be. But the other point you made about patri patriotism, you know, being patriotic, loving your country and wanting your country to uh, to to shine and to win and to be successful. Again, uh, think of the athlete, right? Athletes passionately love their team. And they this passionate love of their own team is completely compatible with being absolutely outraged when somebody comes to them, a teammate, let's say, and says, look, I have this, my daddy is a doctor, I've got this white powder, if we just slip a little bit into the soup right, right. tomorrow night of the other team, you know, they will, they will not be good players tomorrow, you know? Because uh, it's a very clear understanding in that case that there yeah. are rules and that, that, that it is a game and that, that your, your team, you know, in this case, your country, mm -hmm. um, is, is engaged in something that has very firm rules in order for it to be satisfying. Yeah. And there is nothing standing in the way of having that mindset also in regard to economic rules. You know, we say, look, we are in competition with those Chinese and we want to have the better microchips and we want to have the better cell phones and the better television sets and the better space rockets than they do. We want to win in this competition. But we want it to be a fair competition. We don't want to win by cheating. We want to win by fair and square, having the better engineering, the better products, you know, uh, just by being better. So I don't see why this is, uh, you know, why this isn't a thought that could take hold in people, even though it hasn't yet. And if it were to take hold, it is a shareable thought, right? That's a thought that the Chinese can share. They can say, yeah, we feel the same way. We completely disagree with you about who should win. It's us, the Chinese, we should win. But about the level playing field, we agree with you. We absolutely, this must be a fair competition. And, uh, you know, otherwise winning is just shameful if you do it any other way. That the, that the overriding thing is the game, so to speak, right? And the game is, is the, um, the common good of the entire 
collective yeah. of humanity. It's justice and the common good, those two elements, right? Uh, so common good means uh, things like averting harm from humanity, making sure it survives long term, it has the resources, it doesn't soil its environment, and so on and so forth. And justice means that there is a fair distribution of opportunities so that everybody can compete, you know, that you don't have any unfair advantages in this competition, that children, no matter where they may be born, have a reasonable chance to join the world economy, to make a contribution to human progress. That's great. Um, David comments in the, in the chat, what if countries don't have a common agreement of morality? I know you've written on this too, but yeah. it's kind of a basic. They don't. I mean, this this is, uh, we don't have to say what if. They don't. They don't have a common agreement on morality. They agree on a few things, and that's a good start. But the rest we have to work out. And working it out means we have to talk with each other. We have to engage in moral discussion on two levels. There is the procedural and the substantive, right? We have to talk about issues. And we also have to talk about how to resolve uh, disagreements when we cannot agree on the issues. Ideally, we would all uh, discuss it until we all agree, but that's not going to happen. And we will need to have institutions like we do on the national level, institutions where in the end we vote on things uh, or have some other decision-making process, right? It, uh, we could, it, voting is not always the best solution. Sometimes you uh, may pick uh, experts to do things, like we have the Federal Reserve Bank that decides certain things. We could have, uh, you know, the lottery systems and so on. There are all sorts of ways in which decisions can be made if agreement cannot be reached, but there should always be the effort to reach agreement, or at least to clarify the disagreement by sitting down together and exchanging arguments. Right? That should be the spirit, and we should uh, demand of our representatives that they engage in that sort of a discussion, that they not use strong arm tactics to get their way in international negotiations, but that they put forward what they conscientiously believe is a good argument, an argument that they would be willing to support, you know, for the premises that they would be willing to support in all sorts of other contexts as well, even when it's not to their own advantage. I was just going to throw consensus out there as a possibility for like consensus processes, but, um, and, and David also is adding, um, how does time pressure affect the capacity for reason solutions? But it sounds like mm -hmm. that's included in what you're saying a little bit. Yeah, it's. I mean, time pressure makes it harder to come to a reason solution. And uh, what it may lead to is that in uh, cases where we know that decisions under time pressure will often have to be made, we have to find a good mechanism that makes these decisions for us, you know, where we can make decisions in real time. So, for example, a parliament often has a standing committee where the standing committee then acts when the parliament is not in session or when something needs to be done really quickly, right? Uh, courts sometimes have special uh, procedures where uh, two members of the court can uh, be appealed to and can make a quick decision uh, just because it is needed very quickly because a human life depends on it, for example. So this is familiar from uh, the national level and we need something similar at the global level. Uh, to be sure, the quality of decision-making, the moral quality of decision-making will suffer if you have to decide under time pressure, but uh, the moral losses, if you don't make your decision in time, uh, are often much greater. And so you have to do the best you can under time pressure, rather than let uh, some default take hold that may be much worse.
Uh, I think I think everybody's just kind of like I took them all <laughs> under the table. I'm not yeah. proud of it. <laughs> so. Nicholas, Nihilis. <laughs> yeah. You're so good, Jerry. I see you that you have in the nice. chat all sorts of uh, amplifications. This is so, so nice, you know? Well, I like to support what's being said if I can. But Yeah, but more than support, you sort of clarify and amplify. This is great. Okay, we have... <laughs> We have about a, a half a half a minute left in our okay. in our scheduled. <laughs> but um, I you know if people have something to to throw in there, everybody's saying that they really enjoyed it. So uh, well, the, I love the word intriguing. <laughs> when intriguing. you know when you when you ask somebody uh, how do I look, and the person says intriguing. It's not very reassuring. <laughs> anyway. It's a well, George, you can expand if you want to. No, no. Don't <laughs> force him to, to sort of... Uh, I like the nice. That is... Uh, the intriguing will... It's nicely ambiguous. You know, it could be positive. You it never know. Be. It could be. Well, I... I uh, upon the <laughs> George Bennett is a compliment. So. Of course. <laughs> what else can he say? You know, I, I think that you should charge us all now uh, as we as we go out into the world to make this happen. Um, so our first steps should be, I don't know, maybe to start talking with our representatives and so on as though we believed this, that this was their job. Do you think? Or? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 this needs to be thought about much more. You know, this is astonishingly under uh, theorized. There is an enormous amount of theorizing about the world we are living in and how one acts in that world and how one, you know, does things and how you can sometimes act morally despite the modus vivendi framework and so on. But what the world really needs is systemic change. If we stick with this system, it is totally predictable that more and more powers will have more and more advanced technologies that are incredibly dangerous. You know, it's uh, a, these nuclear weapons are just minutes they take to get to their destinations and you know, the danger of an accident or the danger of a, a war breaking out even without accident between any old powers is uh, is very great. And of course, being a member of the nuclear club brings all sorts of power advantages. So everybody sooner or later tries to join that club. We have it currently with Iran. We have it with North Korea, of course. And <clears throat> so in the long run, Right? How is this going to work? How is this going to work? And the other thing that is uh, disconcerting is that all the big issues that humanity should solve together are incredibly difficult to solve by actors who are constantly focused first and foremost on their power position, right? If we agree to this treaty about the environment, isn't this going to favor China? How is this going to affect the power balance between China and the US? The Chinese have a head start on solar technologies. Isn't that going to benefit them? And if it benefits them, then, you know, they will grow faster than we do. And then in 1935, uh, sorry, 2035, we will uh, be overtaken by the Chinese and so on. So no, no, we shouldn't really uh, do solar technology. We should have some other technology where we have a head start and we are better and so on. So everything is infused and infected by this mad struggle for power, which is totally understandable given that the others are madly focused on power, right? Then, then I have to be madly focused on power too. This is the self-fulfilling prophecy part. We have to get out of that whole mindset and do it very carefully, step by step, in, you know, to moralize the world. 
Okay. With these, yeah, and I, I do hope that you all will do a bit of thinking on this and a little bit of political action on this also. The Enlightenment was a great idea, a great time of optimism and hope. And, you know, we, we've almost blown it, but we have a chance, I think, to get back on track. <clears throat> 